2 Kings chapter 3. And we'll be starting in verse 16 of chapter 3. You'll recall that we're studying now a series on the ministry of Elisha. And we've seen that his ministry in many ways parallel the ministry of the risen Christ through his church. And we just uh, considered this episode in the first 15 verses of chapter 3 of Second Kings, which is, involves the alignment of the godly king of Judah, Jehoshaphat, along with the ungodly king of Israel, Jehoram, and then also with the heathen king of Edom. Now these countries were stacked right upon top of one another. Uh, north and south, with uh, Israel being the northernmost, and Judah in the middle, and then Edom south of, uh, of Judah. And you'll recall that Moab had been a province, sort of, of Israel, and they had rebelled. And so uh, the king of Israel wanted some help in trying to bring them under control again. You'll recall that uh, the godly king, Jehoshaphat, says, sure, I'll be glad to help you. And uh, these Edomites down here, they're kind of paying tribute to us, and they're my satellites, and so uh, we'll get them on it too because we want to go through their land. And so the three of us uh, ought to be able to take Moab pretty well. And then you'll uh, recall that on two other occasions, this same king had allied himself with... Uh, the evil kings of Israel, two other of them, the brother of this one and the father of this one, and that he had been rebuked, rebuked sharply uh, by God through various ministries in uh, having been al so aligned that uh, he was told that God's servants just don't align themselves with uh, the ungodly to do uh, the work that God has set about for them to do in the world. And the parallel, of course, in the Christian life, this would be like a, a saved person who's dedicated and surrendered himself to the Lord, engaging in an endeavor, uh, teamed up with an apostate Christian, that's someone that might probably save but carnal. This would be the uh, instance of Israel. They were chosen to be God's people, but they were in a sadly backslidden condition here to even to the extent that uh, they were worshiping idols and had slain the prophets of God and so forth. And then Edom, uh, always in the Bible, represents uh, the natural man, the unregenerate man. Remember, Edom was a nation descended from Esau. And there's a comment on Esau in the 12th chapter of Hebrews where it said that he was a profane man and profane simply means the opposite from spiritual, that uh, he regarded uh, things unspiritual. Now, a profane, a profane man might very well be quite religious, as Esau was, and he regarded spiritual things as long as they didn't any, in any way interfere with his material welfare and his physical welfare. In other words, an Edomite is one who puts the uh, natural exigencies and uh, uh, ahead of spiritual things. For instance, we pointed out that King Herod uh, was an Edomite. He was not an a Israelite, and he had a party called the Herodians. And the Herodians were the true Israelites who said that we ought to accommodate ourselves to the Roman uh, uh, people in every way and go along with them so that we can have peace and well-being and so forth. In other words, uh, whatever the world situation is, accommodate your faith and your belief to that so that you can get along with everybody and there'll be no uh, uh, confusion and there'll be no uh, opposition and uh, uh, just uh, everybody will uh, be happy together. When you see the other side's uh, got you outnumbered, well, uh, compromise with them. That's what a, an Edomite says. So it would be like a Christian. Uh, going out uh, on a project, uh, here's a, 
here's a back a Christian in a backslidden condition and he thinks something needs to be done uh, for God in this case Moabite, Moab needs to be brought in the line to God's uh, program and it's a uh, it's a situation where a spiritual person will ally himself with a backslidden Christian and with someone that has no spiritual inclinations at all uh, that's uh, completely unsaved and expect God to bless it now why do you suppose if that were the truth uh, true why did God we might say actually bl bless Jehoshaphat here because look what we read in the 16th verse second Kings 3 and he said that is uh, God's prophet Elisha said thus saith the Lord make this valley full of ditches now you see what had happened was the three kings had gone down into the uh, desert land the wilderness of Edom it's called and uh, they had found that there was no water for their cattle and no water for their soldiers and uh, the uh, Israelite king the, the evil king of Israel got all excited and he says oh he says, God has brought us down here in this wilderness so that we'll be uh, thirsting to death and then the Moabites will come and and slay us all and uh, and what a terrible, terrible thing. And he began to moan and carry on in the portion that we read last week. And Jehoshaphat says that he was a spiritual king. He says, well, let's tell you what let's do. Let's find us a prophet of God and find out what we should do. Let's call upon the name of the Lord. And so that's when Elisha was brought into it by Jehoshaphat. And remember, Elisha said, look, he says, I wouldn't do anything for this crowd uh, except that... Uh, Jehoshaphat has shown himself to be on God's side in the in the past and therefore I'll get involved and I'll tell you what to do now what I want you to do is to make this valley full of ditches 17th verse for thus saith the Lord ye shall not see wind neither shall ye see rain yet that valley shall be filled with water that ye may drink both ye and your cattle and your beasts and this is but a light thing in the sight of the Lord. He will deliver the Moabites into your hands. Now, I don't know how many of you have a, a new Schofield reference Bible, but if you have one, I'll, turn, I'll help you turn to a map which will help you to understand the, the situation. Look in the back of your Bibles and those that have a different type of Bible. Uh, find the map that shows uh, the Sinai Peninsula and uh, the, the Dead Sea if you can. In uh, the New Schofield, it would be map number two, which covers a double page with the Great Sea right on top. I think in uh, the older Schofield Bible, it would be plate number three. Uh, you'd have one in there. Well, now, the, the map I'm going to be describing is in the back of the New Schofield Bible, and, and therefore yours might be slightly different. But if you'll see a, a sea, a, a body of water, right in the upper right-hand corner called the Salt Sea, or it might be the Dead Sea in some of your Bibles. And then down below that is the, uh, the Red Sea or the Gulf of Aqaba. And uh, in between, there's a strip of land called the Araba, A-R-A-B-A. -A. Now, the geography here is this. Between the Great Sea, which is the Mediterranean Sea, and this uh, uh, low valley, see uh, this uh, arm of the Red Sea called the Gulf of Aqaba, and uh, the the Dead Sea, which uh, is the end of the the Jordan River, and this uh, low valley in between called Araba. That's part of the Great Rift, a uh, uh, great division. It's in mostly below sea level. In your New Schofield Bible, you see just uh, south of the Salt Sea, you see a kind of a pink uh, lavender-like coloring. Well, that, uh, that indicates that that is below sea level. All of that that's pink is below sea level. Then you see some dotted blue lines. That means that's the flow of rivers, only there's no river there usually to flow. It's a, it's a dry river uh, bed. Well, what happens here? This is very dry land. And the only time it gets any rain is very, very occasionally when a northwest wind will come across from the Great Sea and sweep across the upper part of the Sinai Peninsula and uh, the Sinai Peninsula gets to a height of from two to 3,000 feet between the Great Sea and this Araba. And then the Araba is uh, below sea level mostly. And then just to the east of that, the land rises in an escarpment very sharply to an elevation from 
uh, anywhere from 4,500 to 5,500 feet high. And if you'll see a, a city there called Sela, S-E-L-A, or Petra, it has two different names. That was the capital of the Edomites. That was their capital city, and it sat up on this es escarpment, which was uh, uh, some a mile above the uh, high, straight up a mile above the, the valley, uh, the floor valley. Well, very occasionally, a wind would come sweeping off of the great sea, laden with moisture, and it would uh, go over this dry land, and when it would hit that escarpment, uh, it would be uh, sent up, and it would shed just torrential rain down on uh, that mountain of Edom, or that sharp rise uh, of escarpment, and that water would just rush towards the Dead Sea, which was the low spot. See, the Dead Sea here is 1,300 feet below sea level. And uh, sometimes it wouldn't get to the Dead Sea. Now, see how the rivers stop before they get to the Dead Sea? Because the land there is very porous, and it, it just sort of, the, the sand soaks it up. Well, now, the fact that he said, ye shall not see wind nor rain, probably means that what was happening, they're way up here just south of the Salt Sea. That's the, uh, that's the wilderness of Edom. You, you see, the, the natural way for them to have gone to Moab would be to cross the River Jordan up there at Jericho, because Jericho was in uh, the, the part of Israel. Uh, Judah was just immediately west of the Salt Sea, and uh, Edom uh, was south of the Salt Sea, and as you can see, Moab is east of the Salt Sea. So the way they would normally have gone would have been cross the River Jordan above the Salt Sea and come in. Uh, they, they had asked the question, which way should they go? Look back in verse 8 of chapter 3. And he said, which way shall we go up? And he answered, the way through the wilderness of Edom. In other words, let's go around the south end of the Salt Sea rather than uh, up over the north side of the Salt Sea. They thought they'd have a better advantage of, of attacking him. Uh, attack, attacking them uh, from the rear because their fortifications were all to the north of their country because they were not expecting to be attack, attacked from the wilderness. And, and this, of course, is why the, the armies that, that were attacking Moab uh, got into trouble. They tried to traverse an area where there wasn't any water, no vegetation, no habitation, and uh, so they were just about to perish. They were in this uh, low, uh, dry uh, place. Well, now, I don't know whether God uh, had this water, just uh, whether he miraculously made the water, or whether it came from natural sources. I rather uh, presume that, that he uh, did a very natural thing. He just let this moist wind from the great sea hit this escarpment uh, farther south, where they couldn't see and be involved in it. They were down there in the valley, and the, the torrential rain came forth, forth uh, down, this, down this valley towards the, the sea. And what he had them to do was to build uh, a succession of lateral canals across the valley so that when the water came sweeping down it filled up success, uh, uh, successively each one of those ditches. Now, if, if God chose to do it in a natural way, this is the way it would have been done. Then they would have, wouldn't have seen a drop of rain because the rain would have been many miles south of them and neither would they have been involved with the wind. It would have hit the mountains uh, way below them and flowed this way. And this uh, is no doubt the way God handled the situation if it was handled from natural causes. Well, why, why did God do this? Uh, it, there was a miracle, obviously, uh, one way or the other. If it was nothing else than uh, the miracle of uh, God foretelling what he would, would do uh, to his prophet. Uh, so why did God permit them to be uh, saved in this way? Well, first place, Elisha had already made it quite clear that he was only ministering to the Judites, Jehoshaphat. And the only reason that the others got any benefit at all is because they happened to be along. Well, why would God bless Jehoshaphat when he was aligned in such a way that displeased God? Well, you see, to ask such a question shows uh, on our part an ignorance of how God operates. We're thinking in terms of how we would operate. If we have a, a child or if we have a friend and they're always doing things contrary to our wishes and going some other way, well, then we, would, we wouldn't have fellowship with them, would we? Uh, we'd cut them off. We'd say, look, if you can't please me at all, well, go find you another friend. But God does, that's not the criterion upon which God uh, measures uh, blessings or meets out blessings. 
he blesses those first who are his because they're his in Christ. And number two, he blesses them to the extent that they exercise faith towards him or that they trust him. You're not blessed or cared for by God in respect to how well you live up to his precepts. Now, I know this is an erroneous thought among Christians, but it's not true. God blesses you first because you are one with Christ if you're saved, and then to the extent that you place your trust in your God. That's the extent to which he blesses you. And notice here, Jehoshaphat had said what we need to do is to get a word from God. Well, that showed that he trusted God, regardless of, of how far he was uh, in his walk from where God would have him. And then number two, if they hadn't dug the ditches, they wouldn't have had the water. The water would have just, uh, if it had come from natural sources, would have just all soaked up in the desert sand. It was necessary for them to have faith in what God had said. And there was no rain around. This is why God did it this way, so that they, now if they had seen a cloud on the horizon, or if they'd uh, seen it looks like a rainstorm coming up, well then obviously uh, they would gladly uh, uh, dig the ditches. But see, the rain, if that's how it happened, was uh, miles and miles and miles away, and they couldn't see it. They saw no rain. And so they had no way of knowing it was going to rain, and all of a sudden the water was upon them. And if they hadn't dug the ditches, they wouldn't have had the water. Uh, so you see, they exercised faith. They trusted what God said. And it was rather a ridiculous thing to do, if you'll think about it. It really took faith. It, it was ridiculous, wasn't it, Brad? To go out there and dig ditches. Noah did the same thing. Yeah, Noah did the same thing. See, without faith it is impossible to please him. But God honors faith in him regardless of the spiritual uh, walk of the one exercising the faith. And that's why God heard and answered his. And notice, too, that God used a human spokesman in order to get his message across. Water stands for life. And in Edom, there's no real life, I'll assure you. Because Edom is the natural man, and he'll die. He's a wilderness. He lives in a wilderness. He's in a wilderness land. And uh, the only life, the only way they could bring life in is, is for God to bring it. And God used a human instrument that was yielded to him. Now, he didn't bring life to Jehoshaphat, because Jehoshaphat was out of fellowship. You see, and he wasn't doing uh, God's work God's way. So God didn't use Jehoshaphat. God used a man who was surrendered to God. But Jehoshaphat received the blessing. Now, eternally, you see, the reward would go to Elisha, not Jehoshaphat. Jehoshaphat wanted from God an immediate temporal uh abetment, didn't he? He wanted God to help him now with a, with a material problem, and that's what God did. And when you get to heaven, you'll find that uh, Jehoshaphat is not going to be rewarded eternally for this episode. Elisha will be. But there, there was a, one of God's servants exercising faith towards God. You know, I was... I had a young man come by to see me a week ago last Wednesday morning uh, to try to sell me some securities. And uh, he was a security salesman. And uh, so uh, I asked him if he'd like to go to lunch with me. And uh, so uh, he said, all right. And so on the way, I told him we were going to Christian businessmen's luncheon on, on a Wednesday. <laughs> and uh, we had a good testimony that day, and I asked him, if he, um, what he thought about that, uh, the testimony, he says, well, it's, it's obvious that that fellow has had a valid experience. And I asked him if he'd ever trusted the Lord for his own salvation. He says, well, I figure that I have a good relationship with God because, he says, I was in the Navy 
And he says, I was in some very rough water and I fell overboard and, and I was drowning. And the, just before I lost consciousness, consciousness, I cried out to God to save me. And it says the next, uh, when I uh, woke up or became gained consciousness, people had me out on the deck uh, working on me. And uh, says, so uh, I know that I'm uh, in God's favor because uh, I called upon him in desperation. He answered my call. And I said, Ed, when you called upon God, did you have in mind his saving you physically so that you could live on this earth a while longer, or did you have in mind your eternal salvation, your life forever? And he thought about it and he says, well, uh, I guess both. And I said, well, I want you to think real carefully. Were you thinking in terms of, uh, of eternal life? And he said, no, I guess I wasn't. I just didn't want to die. And I said, well, God answered the request that you asked. Now, have you ever asked God for his wonderful gift of eternal life? Have you ever said, God, I want to live beyond death? Uh, someday you're going to die. God's not going to save you from physical death forever. And uh, have you ever asked God for life through death? And life then says, well, I guess I never have. And I says, well, God's uh, just given you what you've asked for. Now, you better ask for the important thing. And uh, he says, well, uh, I'll, I'll come back. And he had an appointment. And he says, I'll come back later today and, and, and talk to you some more. And, uh, but he never did, and I haven't heard from him since. But I'll uh, see if I can get in touch with him again. Anyway, you see, God furnished what Jehoshaphat asked for, and it was temporal. There's a, uh, there's a spiritual application here, and, and we've made it, that water means life. And it stands for life in the Bible. And whether it's life or sustenance here on this earth, or whether it's eternal life. Christ said, out of his innermost being should flow rivers of living, living water. And whichever life it is, you see, life here was in the hands of God's true servant, not in the hands of Jehoshaphat. He had to follow the instructions, but the instructions came from God through a surrendered, dedicated man, not somebody who was aligned with the enemy. And we see this around us so many times. Uh, I see uh, Christians engaged in things that are uh, obviously unscriptural. And they say, well, God is blessing me. Uh, I must be doing what God wants me to do because he's so good to me. Well, the, the, the poor person just has such a low concept of their God. That's the only problem. The responsibility of, of living up to what uh, he desires from me is my responsibility. Uh, he, because of his character, he cannot help but bless me because I'm in Christ and I exercise faith and those are the requirements. And he must bless me. That's his, that's his character. And I'll not, I'll not take that and rest on it and say, well, my, God must be pleased with me and what I'm doing because look how he blesses me. No, I have a responsibility to seek and find out the mind of God. That's why Paul would cry out, uh, after a lifetime of service, oh, that I might know him. He realized that he, he had an obligation to seek the mind of his God because God does not bless dependent upon how good a walker I am. He blesses dependent upon two things. Am I in Christ? Do I have all spiritual blessings in high places because I'm one with Christ? Number one, that's the first requirement. Next, do I appropriate the power of God by just placing my trust in him for whatever? Those are the requirements. But for rewarded service, eternal rewards for service, this is reserved for those. To, to seek to know him and to do things God's way, God's way. 
It's the difference between when we say, well, God sure blesses me, we're talking about here, aren't we? Temporal blessings. I trust that we can, we can assimilate this and see it. Besides, this great uh, Moab was very uh, badly defeated, you'll recall, and, and the, uh, the three allied kings here came out real well. But it was very temporary. It wasn't any time but before Moab and Edom was aligned against Judah. All you've got to do is read on here a little further and you'll find that, that, Judah was ne uh, that Edom next was fighting Judah. They weren't any true allies. They just had a common cause for a moment. But uh, how can two walk together continuously lest they be agreed? That's not possible. You might carry on a campaign together and the campaign might even be successful. But how can you walk? How can you carry on a walk except you be agreed? So I trust that this teaches a lesson, and of course this is what all of these Old Testament stories are for. And if we don't realize that, if we don't look for a, a lesson for our own selves in each of these stories, well, then we're just missing what God has for us because he says very, uh, very clearly, that the, all of these things happened unto the children of Israel, for example, and they are written for our admonition upon whom the ends of the world have come. 1 Corinthians 10, 11. Or whatsoever things were written aforetime were written for us that we might have the patience and the comfort of the Scriptures. That's not an exact quotation, but it's, uh, I believe, Romans 15, 4. These things were written down for us, and there's a lesson here for us. Well, as we go on into the fourth chapter, let's see if we can find a lesson here. Here's a very uh, concise story, uh, but there's a lesson here for us. In 2 Kings chapter 4, now, now there cried a certain woman of the wives of the sons of the prophets. Here they are again. She cried unto Elisha, saying, Thy servant, my husband, is dead, and thou knowest that thy servant did fear the Lord, and the creditor is come to take unto him my two sons to be bondmen or slaves. And Elisha said unto her, What shall I do for thee? Tell me, what hast thou in thine house? And she said, Thine handmaid hath not anything in the house except a pot of oil. Then he said, Go borrow thee vessels from all thy neighbors, even empty vessels. Borrow not a few. And when thou art come in, thou shalt shut the door upon thee and upon thy sons, and shalt pour out into all those vessels, and thou shalt set aside that which is full. So she went from him, and shut the door upon her and upon her sons, who brought the vessels to her, and she poured out. And it came to pass, when the vessels were full, full that she said unto her son, Bring me yet a vessel. And he said unto her, There is not a vessel more, and the oil stayed. And she came and told the man of God, and he said, Go sell the oil, and pay thy debt, and live thou and thy children on the rest. Now first we find that this was the wife of one of the sons of the prophets, or one who claimed uh, to be God's uh, servant. And uh, you notice that she didn't go call upon his fellow uh, sons of the prophets. But she found someone in whom she knew the Spirit of God well. When uh, you find a minister in one of the modern social churches, and if he really gets in trouble, he doesn't go to his fellow ministers and ask for prayer. He knows they're just like he is. He seeks them out, one, of, one that he has disdained, and asks for help and for prayer. You know, years ago, I had a secretary, and she came to Lakeland uh, from Troy, New York, she and her family, and they had uh, attended a Presbyterian church up there. And so when uh, they came to Lakeland, they went to the nearest Presbyterian church. Well, it so happened that it was 
what is now known as Covenant Presbyterian, which is a church not affiliated with, with the regular Presbyterians, and they really preached the gospel. And they had a preacher there then named Lindy Gebb. And old Lindy would really, he really poured it on. So in the meantime, somebody from up in uh, Troy, New York, some of their ex-preacher, somebody knew of uh, uh, one of the uh, one of the um, hierarchy of the Northern Presbyterian Church. You know, they have a they have a church in Lakeland that uh, was ahead of the Presbyterian homes down in Lakeland retirement complex, and he had been pastor, and he, he was quite a wheel in the denomination. And he was interim pastor at, at this other Presbyterian church. So when they got the letter saying that they should go see him, they went to see him. And uh, I don't even mind telling you his name. His name is Dr. Johnson. And uh, he's got all the theological degrees. He's a graduate from Princeton Seminary. And he's, uh, he's highly regarded in the circle. And uh, so he told my secretary that she shouldn't have anything to do with this church where they preached the gospel because they weren't real Presbyterians. Uh, they were just sort of an off-brand that called themselves Presbyterians, and they were off-base, and he, she ought to come to his church. And uh, that's what she did. And later on, I was able to lead her and her brothers to the Lord. Uh, but uh, she told me this story. Well, now, Dr. Johnson has two daughters. One of them has become such an alcoholic that she's almost demented. She just doesn't think clearly. And the other one is uh, Anna Bising. Uh, uh, Anna is uh, the wife of a man who was saved through the CDMC three or four years ago in Lakeland. Uh, he works for the People's Bank down there. Uh, his first name slipped from mine right now. Bising, B U S I N G. Tom, Tom, I believe. No. Anyway. But Anna and her husband and son have all recently been saved, and they attend my Thursday night Bible study every Thursday night. And her father, this big hierarchy man, uh, is just beside himself with the problem of the other daughter. He came to my Bible study two or three times, and he has been seeking spiritual help from me. Now, I don't want to compare myself with Elisha in any way, but uh, I just want to point out that when these fellows get into real trouble, they don't go to their own. And she didn't go to her own. This man was able to see something in the life of Anna and her family. And they know. These sons of the prophets, they recognize the Spirit of God in Elisha. They know. The Bible plainly says these fellows that uh, head up these big uh, churches that are way out in left field, they know. They, the Bible says that they are willingly ignorant. And when the chips are down, they seek somebody who's in touch with God, not their own. You know, as best I know, this Dr. Johnson is a saved man, as best I can tell. But he's been so brainwashed through the years by this system. He's ground corn for the Philistines so long that he's just been blinded, and he's spiritually impotent, not even able to lead his own daughters to a saving knowledge of Christ. Isn't that pitiful? And as I've, uh, as I've uh, prayed with him and talked with him, as best I know, he's had a true conversion experience, and he has some real spiritual insights in some areas that it's hard to it would be hard for me to believe that the man is, is not saved. 
but uh, he he sure he sure doesn't know how to rest in the Lord, and he really is a confused man. He just can't understand why Anna waited so long because it, it wasn't uh, any time at all ago when she was having big parties and. Uh, the only difference between her and her sister was her sister uh, couldn't uh, lay off of it, and she could. And I've talked to the sister and dealt with the sister, and she, she wants she wants to understand, but her mind is not good enough to to uh, really grasp what you're saying. And she just doesn't stay stay sober long enough really to get the thing really formulated in her mind. But she's in ways she's desperate. Well, I didn't mean to go into all this, except to tell you that we know, we know when God's in a life, or we can know. And she came to someone who she knew was in touch with God, because she had a real problem. But you know, there's a sense in which her problem is just exactly like the problem of everybody involved in anything less than true spirituality. Their, their children grow up and become slaves. Dr. Johnson's two daughters were slaves to sin. One of them still is. And uh, they're, they're just like these, just like these, uh, this woman here. And uh, her sons would have died if they hadn't, hadn't helped. But you know, this woman had one thing. She had some oil. And this tells us that she, somewhere, had found the true God. It wasn't much oil. And it wasn't enough to do the job. Except that God multiplied it. But she had oil. And she had faith. It took some faith now to go around to all the neighbors and borrow pots and pans. That was no small thing in those days. It wasn't like now where everybody's got a kitchen full. But can't you imagine those other housewives saying, well, what in the world do you want with those? And she says, well, uh, there's a man of God who said that if I'll bring enough pots and pans, that I'll get enough oil that I can uh, get out of my trouble. What? Say that again. It, it took some faith, didn't it? And notice that the sons entered into this with her. What do you suppose if, if, if they had decried it? No. They saw something in that mother. They knew that she had some confidence somewhere. She had enough oil. Oh, see, the oil, oil in the Bible stands for the power of the Spirit of God. The Spirit of God as he empowers. She had enough of that oil in her life that she had discernment enough to know who was God's man first, and she had enough to that she had enough to exercise faith, and she had enough to influence her son. That's more than Lot had, wasn't it? But he, if she was an influence, and they followed her, and the, and they exercised faith. And notice there was sufficient here to pay all that she owed, and then enough to sustain them, in the seventh verse it says, from then on. And that's what happens. You see, when, when I'm poverty-stricken, when I've uh, gone a long way from God, when I've got involved in just religious systems, and I've not exercised my faith, but still I'm saved, when God brings me to the end of myself and I seek true spiritual help, then the measure to which the Spirit of God supplies is only limited by the measure of my faith to the extent that she exercised her faith in securing vessels, they were filled. And that's the only thing that limited it. Do you believe if she'd got half as many vessels, 
that she would have had the same amount of oil? Would she? No. But if she had twice as many vessels, she'd have twice as many oil, or much oil, wouldn't she? But no, she had sufficient, really. So we know that she was a woman who, who rested in God. And, and her faith is the common faith of every mother or every parent who's saved but has no idea about getting involved in true spiritual activity. Just like, just like with Dr. Johnson, as best I know, that man, way back in his young life, had a true saving encounter with the Lord Jesus Christ. But he didn't, he, he wasn't able even to save his own daughters, you might say, or lead them in such a way that they would be saved. No doubt this woman was uh, following her own son and pretty well uh, tied up with the program of the Sons of the Prophet, which we've seen in our series of stories here was not productive. And we're, we'll find they, we're not finished with them yet. We, uh, if we need any more confirmation, we will find it. It's, there, there's plenty more here. But I see here uh, a saved person who, when they'll come to the end of themselves and exercise the faith, and seek out true spirituality that the Spirit of God will supply all they can use, pay all their debts, you might say. And I take another courage here. I, I get this from this. Maybe God didn't intend it here. But in my Bible studies, I quite frequently come across Christians. I'd say my Bible studies are made up uh, almost half of this type of person. A person that was saved, actually, in their young life. And who just, from true spirituality, had just wasted it in religious programs for years and years and years, and maybe when they're 40 or 50 years old or so, they see something real. And they become interested in spiritual things. I see from this that God does not hold against them one single hour of that misspent time. He's just not that kind of a God. But he fills them from there on out just as full as full can be. And from the time they turn to God and seek him out, that's the time from which he measures. Not from the time that they were saved. And this ought to be a real comfort to some of us. It went on for years, unproductive. That, uh, I, and I see several indications, I see this in, same indication in several places. It comes out quite strongly in, in Ezekiel, where he's talking about uh, one who turns from their wicked ways. He's talking about uh, Christians here, not unsaved people. And uh, I, see, uh, I see this. God is so long-suffering. He doesn't say, he doesn't look back and say, he doesn't do it this way. He doesn't say, now look, I graciously saved you when you were 13 years old, and here you did walk your own obstinate way for years and years and years, and now here you come to me when you're 48 and give your life to me. What kind of a so-and-so are you? Well, now, uh, I might uh, help you out some, and I might give you some blessings, but you're really in hot soup because you wasted so many years. No, he doesn't do it that way. Do you remember the story of the husbandman that needed some workers in his vineyard and he went out and got some early in the morning and then he got some later in the day and then he got some late in the evening? I don't see this as a picture of somebody got saved early in life and somebody got saved uh, later in life. I don't see that. I see it as someone whose service began, whose true dedicated service began, either early in the morning or at noontime or in mid-afternoon or late in the evening. And when the time came for reckoning, they all got paid the same. didn't they? 
I suppose you know the story I'm talking about. They all got paid the same. Tom, don't we have to be a little bit careful there that we don't assume that, I mean, supposing I'm, I'm still not saved yet, and, and I, I hear you say this, well, I think, well, I can go on yet for a while, but, uh, but uh, the thing we forget is that we're only one heartbeat away from the Lord Jesus Christ any minute of this day or night. Because we're talking about people that are already saved, and for one to have oh, that yeah. type and for one to have that type of an attitude towards God would show something just not ticking right anyhow. You see, uh, a, a person with any spiritual inclination at all would be appreciative of that, rather than having it turn them off, uh, that, that, that God is that way. Now, there is such a thing as someone who saves and has light. And then, uh, because they want to go their own selfish way, they need God. They'll not be uh, receive the same reward. But you see, God measures our reward based upon our heart's desire to know him and to show him forth in this wicked world. And it's not a matter of the number of years we do that. It's the extent to which we have a mind that way. And uh, so, I see here uh, a, com a complete uh, feeling to take care of all of the wasted years, whatever they were, and they're sufficient, sufficient power from God uh, for whatever God might have in store. Do you have any comments about this little story here? In 1 Corinthians 3, there's a building on the true foundation of Christ, uh, gold, silver, precious stones, wood, hay, and stubble. And that's uh, explained as being uh, what one does with his Christian life. And if he has wood, hay, and stubble, uh, it's firm, yet he himself is saved, yet so is through fire. Uh, wouldn't there uh, be some account taken of whether the whole life was spent for the Lord or whether uh, much of it was spent on earthly things only? Well, um, I, I wouldn't want to uh, be real dogmatic one way or the other just now. And certainly, uh, there are, God makes award to those who faithfully run the race for years and years. For instance, I take that to be uh, the way you earn the crown incorruptible, uh, spoken of by Paul in 1 Corinthians chapter 9. Just the patient, daily, uh, staying under the body, the long, even Christian run over the years. Certainly. Uh, God will not be unmindful of a steady life, but we, we still must see that there's, a, there's an area in here in which the heavenly reward is based on the depth of our Christian commitment more than on the length of our Christian commitment, and, pro and probably those who have a longer length of Christian commitment might have more opportunities to have a depth. There might be something there, see. But uh, as I read the parables of the Lord, I think there's much, a much hope, much uh, room in the scriptures for comfort for those who might have been saved early in life and who never really had the light shown. Now, you see, uh, it's a matter of, of light rejected and light received. And uh, uh, there are those, you see, who might have been saved early in life and who were given sufficient light, and they lived for themselves. Well, my, my thought there is God just doesn't bring them into the flow of his service at all. They tend to cut themselves off. They're cast away. Uh, or uh, 
is, uh, as we read in Hebrews chapter 10, I believe about verse 26, for if we sin willfully, after that we have received the knowledge of the truth, and that word is epinosis, which is a full knowledge, if we sin willfully after that we have received the full knowledge of the truth, then there is no more sacrifice for sin but a fearful looking forward of fiery indignation, that same fiery indignation that so devour the adversary, that has caused us to, uh, to leave our path and go our false way. And, of course, this can lead to what the Bible would call being cut off or, or being a castaway or being committing sin unto death and so forth. Uh, so it's a dangerous thing for a Christian to say, uh, well, I'm young and uh, I'm saved and uh, I'm going to have a good time and because I'll surrender maybe when I'm in my 50s or something like that and then I'll be dedicated to God. God won't ever bring that person, as I see it, if he, he has the light into a place of service. And there's nothing we can do toward serving God except the Spirit of God impel us and, and, and draw us uh, to that point. So there, there are various facets to this, and I, I don't want to get our, our sights the wrong place, but I am sure that this te the, the, the Scriptures teach that it's not the length of time that I was saved that determines it, nor is it the uh, amount of years that I was unproductive. It's my whole attitude towards God and my desires towards him from the time that the light shone in and I saw my God and I had a clear opportunity, you might say, uh, to enter into Canaan's land. It might be some people wander in the desert for years before they ever come to Kadesh Barnea, you know. So there are various facets of this, but it's, there's certainly enough here that we need to search it out as far as our own life is concerned. Now, uh, beginning with the eighth verse of chapter four, we have a story that teaches us a, a real lesson, and we'll just start with this and point out some things, so we're only going to read about the first two or three verses. Second uh, Kings 4, 8, And it fell on a day that Elisha passed to Shunem, where was a great woman, and she constrained him to eat bread. And so it was that as often as she passed by, he turned him thence to eat bread. Now, I take this term, great woman, uh, to mean that she was well known and uh, uh, probably uh, one of the uh, uh, more wealthy folks in the area. In other words, she was well known around uh, her area. And she said unto her husband, Behold now, I perceive that this is the holy man of God who passes by us continually. Let us make a little chamber, I pray thee, on the wall or with walls, and let us set for him there a bed and a table and a stool and a candlestick. And it shall be when he cometh to us that he shall turn in thence. Now notice that she recognized, she perceived, she understood that this was a man of God, this Elisha. And this reminds us of, a, of the story of, a, of another woman who was also not an Israelite, and this woman was not an Israelite, evidently, uh, in the life of Elijah. And remember, she says, I know that thou art a holy man of God. She recognized him as such, and she was willing to bake her last cake with a little bit of, of flour and oil and, uh, and give it to him, because she recognized him as being God's servant. Well, someone in the position of this lady has a promise from the lips of the Lord himself, and it's found in Matthew chapter 10. Verse 41, Matthew 10, 41, or let's start with verse 40. And he's talking about his spokesman. He says in Matthew 10, 40, He that receiveth you receiveth me, he that receiveth me receiveth him that sent me. He that receiveth a prophet in the name of a prophet shall receive a prophet's reward. And he that receiveth a righteous man in the name of a righteous man shall receive a righteous man's reward. Now, this woman recognized that Elisha 
with someone who would be eternally rewarded of God. And Christ says that her eternal reward will be the same as his. And you know the Bible really places the responsibility right squarely on the listener to know who is God's spokesman and who isn't God's spokesman. Remember that scripture we've read before in 1st uh, John chapter 2 where uh, and I think it starts with verse 25 or 26 where it says concerning those who seduce you, uh, the false spokesmen, that you need no man should teach you concerning that, that the Spirit of God, the anointing that you've received, the same will teach you. There's no excuse for a Christian being a part of the ministry of somebody who is not God's true spokesman because God has equipped us all that we can know who is and who isn't. He's given a criterion on which to base it. You remember the story in the seventh chapter of John? Uh, it was on the, uh, uh, at the Feast of the Tabernacles. It occurred six months before the death of Christ, and there he was in Jerusalem at the temple teaching, and the religious authorities came up to him and asked him, By what authority are you saying this? Uh, how are we supposed to know whether you're speaking of, for God or whether you're speaking for yourself? And Christ answered him in John 7:17 7, and said, in effect this, If anyone wills to do the will of the Father, he shall know of the teaching, whether it be of God. The one criterion is, if I search my heart and I know that the honest, sincere desire of my heart is to do God's will, God is obligated to let me know whether the spokesman that I'm listening to is his spokesman and whether or not the words are his words. He's obligated, he has already obligated himself to do this for me. And I can know. And therefore, if I become a part of or acquiesce to the ministry who is not a ministry of one who is not God's true spokesman, then I'm just as bad as he is. As a matter of fact, in Ezekiel, I believe it's chapter 14, it says that uh, the punishment for the hearer of the false prophet would be the same as the punishment for the false prophet. God looks upon both the same, the hearer and the listener, and the hearer and the spokesman. Now, if you stop and think it out, if there were no hearers, there would be no spokesman. Who would speak if nobody would hear him? And so when I lend my ears, uh, to the ministry of someone who's not God's true spokesman, whether, I'd, uh, whether I'll acquiesce with what he's saying or whether I say, well, now, I just don't go along with that or not. I am supporting his ministry. I am uh, uh, The testimony of those around me is, well, he, he hears him. He thinks he's all right. And this is why God... Uh, God has this type of a criterion. We're to know those. In First Thessalonians chapter 5, I believe it's verse 12, it says, Paul says, Know those who are among you and who watch over your souls. And this is also in Hebrews chapter 13. That we are to know who is God's spokesman and who isn't. And we, we're without excuse if we say, well, I just didn't know. God said if we wanted to know, we could know. There's no excuse for being a part of a ministry that claims to be God's ministry when it is not, because God will give every discerning heart that knowledge if they want it, if they're really seeking to do his will. And if you don't know, for instance, whether I'm speaking God's words or not, you ought to find out. And uh, if, if I'm not, you ought not to be caught here. Because, you see, I, I claim to come up here from Lakeland to speak for God. That's the only reason I came. That, that's my claim. It's either valid or it's not valid. And you are supposed to know. And that doesn't mean just me. It means anybody else you lend your ears to who claims to be the spokesman for God. It's a grave responsibility to 
to sit under the voice of someone who claims to be God's spokesman, who claims to be speaking for God. Because by speaking, or by sitting under his voice and being a party to what he said, you become a part of his ministry, either for or against Christ. Now that, that's the scripture. And this woman here recognized that this was a man of God, and she wanted to be a part of his ministry. And God, when he's passing out the rewards, he's already obligated himself. Whatever Elisha receives, she receives. You mean everything? Well, that's what Christ said. If I receive a, a prophet in the name of a prophet, I shall receive a prophet's reward. Or if I receive a righteous man in the name of a righteous man, I shall receive a righteous man's reward. Now, one little story, I've told this uh, before, but uh, I'll, I'll tell it again. Some of you may not have heard it. When my wife had been saved, or before she was saved, uh, the Christian Businessmen's Committee in Lakeland planned a layman's crusade. And I was anxious for, uh, for her to be saved. And she'd always been a good hostess. She liked, liked to have company, and she'd uh, always uh, uh, enjoyed fixing, cooking, and waiting on people, that type of thing. So uh, I suggested that they have one of the the uh, Christian families that were coming to be a part of the Lay Crusade to stay at our house, and I had got her permission. And uh, so they picked... Uh, uh, Colonel Jack Fain and his wife Barbara from Atlanta, and they had a, a daughter, and uh, they picked them to come and, and stay at our house. Well, uh, she kind of tricked us because she got saved about four days before they got there. Uh, but uh, the uh, crusade was set up on that basis, and uh, she was just thrilled with having them there and her newfound uh, Christianity and so forth. And uh, they were there for eight days, and they stayed at our house at night, and they ate breakfast there, but they ate other meals somewhere else. As a matter of fact, they had all the crusade families to eat lunch together so they could kind of go over the, the day's work. See, they, as a, in a layman's crusade, you just don't have a meeting at night, but they line up e every business house and uh, factory and everything in town you can have, and they have meetings all during the day. Uh, one spokesman may speak ten times during the day. and. Uh, uh, just uh, everywhere they can get, get an audience. Uh, uh, the employees, of the, they get the various businesses to shut down and employees come in here. It was quite a time. But anyway, uh, they, they made this arrangement. Well, a few months later, there was going to be a, a youth crusade in our town sponsored by Word of Life. And uh, they, uh, they needed someone to keep... Uh, Robbie, Don Robertson, who was the evangelist, and somebody else was signed up to keep the uh, young man who was the musician, the pianist, and so forth. They sang choruses and that type of thing. And uh, so Dot didn't know. We, we weren't involved with Word of Life in any way then, but somebody had arranged to have this youth crusade in town. It was to last a week. And uh, Dot uh, was thinking in terms of how the other one had worked, you know, and so she uh, invited uh, one to come to her house. By that time, we had Denise, and uh, the uh, house was fairly full with four kids, so she decided one would be enough. Well, when they got there, they requested that they both be permitted to stay at the same home because they wanted to uh, be where they could talk over their meetings and so forth. And uh, so uh, it was decided that they both should stay at our house. Well, uh, the musician had never slept with anybody else in a double bed, and so this meant they had to have two separate beds. And uh, it pretty disrupted the family pretty much, you know, to have the two there in, the, in that particular circumstances. All of our all of our people were at home, all of our kids and so forth. And uh, nobody had arranged for them to eat anywhere else. So instead of uh, having one man and feeding him breakfast, once a morning, she had two men, and she fed them three times a day. Not one soul ever invited them out for a meal. She had them for every meal. Well, right about, and she didn't get to go to, she was working so hard, she didn't get to go to any of the meetings. She had no idea what was going on. It was a youth revival anyway. And she was dead tired, and right in the middle of it, Denise, our youngest, who was a year or so old then, got Rosiola. And, uh, 
her fever went up to about 103 or 4. And one morning, just about after they'd been there several days, I thought she was at, just actually going to blow her top. I just thought that she was not going to contain herself. Well, I had subscribed for the little magazine called The Daily Bread, and uh, she had gotten the habit of reading this every morning, but when they were there, she didn't have a chance to, to read it. And I said, well, honey, have you been having your daily devotions? And daily devotions, you know. <laughs> and uh, I said, well, now let's just stop right now. And uh, let's get out, at least let's get out the daily bread and let's, uh, let's see if the Lord has something for it. Well, you just couldn't hardly settle it down. So we turned to the date in the book. And the scripture was from the little book of Third John. And uh, you might want to look at the scriptures that were involved. Some of you, you know, have heard me. Some, uh, at least I get all, enough smiles here. I know at least two thirds of these people have heard the same story before. But uh, uh, anyway, turn to the little epistle of Third John, almost to the back of your Bible, verse five. Beloved, that means saved people, thou doest faithfully whatsoever thou doest to the brethren and to strangers, or it means uh, the brethren who aren't, aren't known to you personally, the strange Christians that come along, who have borne witness of thy love before the church, whom if thou bring forward on their journey after a godly sort, thou shalt do well, because for his name's sake they went forth, taking nothing of the Gentiles, that means the unsaved world. We, therefore, ought to receive such that we might be fellow helpers to the truth. And this was that Bible reading. This is the scripture that the Lord gave her that morning. And, of course, that just fixed everything up, you know. And she wouldn't have had it any other way then. And uh, it became a blessing instead of a, instead of a drudge. But uh, this is an important ministry uh, to care for God's people and recognize. See? There's no trouble. Most, some of the people here know Robbie. There's no trouble recognizing him as God's true spokesman. You know, uh, I was, uh, I had some sort of a problem that I wasn't handling in a spiritual way. I don't remember what it was. And I was a fairly new Christian. And I was kind of bemoaning the fact that my Christianity wasn't showing. And Robbie says, well, it's by little and little, Don, by little and little. He says, you not possess the land all in one year. And that gave me the clue, you know, that's from the 23rd chapter of his, uh, Exodus. And that, that gave me the clue to the spiritual lessons in those, that journey of the children of Israel. And But he was, uh, that, that little admonition right there meant an awful lot in my life. But it shows you that... Uh, but here, in God's Word, it tells us that we have a, an obligation to recognize a true minister of God. And uh, we have an obligation not to be any part of one who claims to be, but isn't. And we have ample measuring sticks to show us that. Shall we pray? Dear God, we thank you again for the admonition of the Scriptures. We thank you for the gentle way in which you deal with us. We thank you that your blessings towards us is not dependent on how good of Christians we are. But we thank you that you're so gracious that your hand is always towards us because we're in Christ and because we want to know and seek our God. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen.